So our next speaker is Michael Wilmer, and he'll be talking about metaprogramming and auto-tuning and the search for high-performance GPU code. Hopefully this will work. There we go. Okay, uh, control this, there we go. Okay, uh, hello, I'm Michael, uh, and this is a presentation on some of the work that uh, I've been doing here with uh, my friends from Bloomington. Um, it's uh, basically the eventual goal that we're going for is uh, optimizing uh, purely functional GPU programs. Uh, in this talk, we'll talk a little bit about that and about uh, functional interfaces for implementing auto-tuning. Right, so, some motivation. There's a GPU. Uh, <laughs> G GPUs are really fast, right? Uh, but GPUs are hard. They're really hard. You have to do low-level manual tuning, and if you make a mistake, you'll blow up and your display driver will lock and everything's awful. Right? Uh, so as a running example, I'm gonna talk about the launch configuration. You know, basically how you decompose your work uh, across threads, warps, blocks, and the grid. And so if you've ever used CUDA, you know NVIDIA provides an occupancy calculator for this, uh, which you sort of feed it the details about your GPU, uh, and it tells you this is how you usually run your program. Uh, but high occupancy doesn't necessarily equal high performance. Uh, and some programs are specialized to specific strategies of work decomposition, and you can't easily change them. Right? And this all sounds bad if you're used to a nice language like Haskell, where you don't have to worry about anything like this. Uh, and of course, we're all here because we love our nice, expressive, high-level languages. Um, so can we use our high-level languages to make our lives easier? Basically, can we play in easy mode? Uh, we want to express our GPU code in a very high-level, beautiful language, uh, and have any of these low-level decisions we have to make made for us automatically. Uh, and we want to have a program performance that's equivalent to our hand-tuned CUDA code, not just roughly comparable to, right? So uh, one way that people have talked about doing this is with magic, specifically auto-tuning magic, right? Uh, and auto-tuning has proven very successful. Uh, and additionally, back to Haskell again, uh, we have embedded DSLs uh, like Obsidian and Accelerate that explore this area. So if we add all this up, do we get easy mode? And no, not really, not in practice. Uh, so unfortunately, if you look at the current state of things, you'd probably say there isn't an easy mode. You know, so that while there are these DSLs for doing GPU programming, they do not necessarily match the performance of handwritten uh, kernels. Uh, and especially in order to achieve the best performance, programmers generally still have to make decisions such as how to use shared memory. Um, and for auto-tuning, it's, done, it's generally done through a very fragile sort of infrastructure. Here, one example would be a C preprocessor. You know, it's, it's, it's a very uh, effective technique, doing auto-tuning, but uh, the way it's typically done is a big, ugly pile of scripts and C preprocessor hacks, uh, or potentially worse. Uh, so running and maintaining programs that use a lot of auto-tuning can be a nightmare. However, it might be possible to combine the fact that we have our nice, uh, high-level uh, embedded DSLs uh, with the fact that we're doing auto-tuning. And I talked about shared memory, so I have to show that. Uh, so this is our approach. Um, combining metaprogramming and auto-tuning, basically. So we embed a DSL for GPU programming and a framework for describing auto-tuning searches alongside each other in the same meta-language, which is Haskell. Uh, so compile time parameters in the GPU kernel are ordinary values in this meta-language. And so the programmer can naturally write their code both for generating and for tuning the GPU kernel in the same place. 
And then we can use Haskell's type system to enforce properties of the auto tuning interface. And we applied this, like I said, our running example is the launch configuration, and there is a lot of low hanging fruit here. So our approach of implementing these kernels and using the, the uh, in the meta language and having the tuning in the meta language made this procedure very easy. Um, we set out to compare a bunch of different kernels and a bunch of different source strategies, and we found, you know, of course, auto tuning works very well, which is what we'd expect. But one thing that we found was that for a lot of these problems, doing any kind of search will yield very good uh, improvements in performance over a naive solution. Uh, and this is not just for running an auto-tuning search for hours or even minutes, but sometimes for seconds. Just doing 20 or 30 evaluations can sometimes lead to a, a noticeable uh, improvement in performance. So with relatively little effort, we are able to automatically come up with, in some cases, uh, equivalent or better uh, than solutions than what was recommended by NVIDIA's tool. So first, some background. There's a compiler. That looks like a compiler, right? Takes source code, but spits out machine code. Right? So if there are any machine-specific optimizations you have to do, they're not in this picture, they're in your head. And you put them in the source code. <coughs> so to introduce auto-tuning, we put a cycle in this picture. We have a, a loop here that goes through this evaluation box. And the evaluation combines one uh, instance of your program with some sample input. Right? And so the different program variants are evaluated according to some metric, like total runtime or maybe energy usage. And this feeds back into the compiler so it makes different choices. Next, uh, how are we doing this? How are we doing uh, kernel generation? Well, we're using a, a very uh, mature and well-designed uh, language called Obsidian. Uh, and unlike other uh, DSLs for doing GPU programming, Obsidian exposes low-level choices programmatically. And in fact, it gives a functional interface to these low-level choices. For example, how to use different levels of the memory hierarchy. Uh, and that T, for example, uh, the type of reduced kernel says that it, its result is some sort of program T. And that's a program that is to be executed at level T in the GPU hierarchy, like thread, warp, grid, block. And in this case, the T parameter is restricted by compute T. And this restriction means that the code can only be in, uh, instantiated as a thread, warp, or block. Because uh, these are the levels of the GPU hierarchy that allow the use of GPU shared memory. So, uh, GPU, or so Obsidian lets you write uh, code that is polymorphic over where it's computed in the GPU. So our framework, uh, what do we want in an auto-tuning framework? Uh, we want to not have to specialize our searches necessarily to each program. Uh, so we want to be able to abstract over different search strategies. But we also want to be able to incorporate domain knowledge. So if we know something about the search space, we want to be able to use it. And we want the implementation of evaluation and comparison to be flexible. So here's an example of uh, you know, how you might do this in Haskell. Uh, a programmer provides an evaluation function or a scoring function, whatever you want to call it. Um, right? uh, here it's taking threads and blocks. Um, and the programmer may provide some custom result type. You know, uh, so they might want to write their own you know, comparison uh, instance for it for how you decide which result is better than another result. Uh, and since this is using Obsidian, Obsidian makes use of the NVIDIA CUDA compiler to compile GPU kernels. This is Monadic since it involves I.O. Right? And the scoring function needs to be able to perform I.O. actions. So the I.O. effect needs to be composed of the tuning effect for which we introduce a class of monads called TuneM. Uh, we'll actually come back to this because this uh, is, doesn't go as far as we can go with uh, using Haskell's type system to enforce some of these properties, but it's good enough for now. So heat maps is a cool feature of GNU plot to, to generate these. Um, these are the four kernels that we evaluated in the paper. I'm actually going to focus on the two interesting ones, the two most interesting ones around there, Mandelbrot and Histogram. We also uh, covered a reduction in breadth for search. This is, this is a lot to look at in a slide. Um, and you probably can't see the, the labels on these things, so I'll talk about those individually. But the big thing to look at is the colors. So these big groups or big splotches of yellow, those are good solutions. And the things that aren't yellow are not good solutions. Right? Um, and some of these plots are actually a little bit limited. Like at the breadth for search, for example, uh, we had to jump in strides of 32 just because we couldn't wait long enough for it to explore the entire search space. Because among other things, it took uh, something like 20 seconds to compile the kernel. 
So Mandelbrot. Uh, everyone knows Mandelbrot here. We're tuning uh, basically how many pixels we compute per thread and block. Um, the plots go down to the left, which is good. Um, so the, the, the uh, side there is time in seconds, so lower time is better. Uh, and um, along the, uh, the other side, the iterations, each iteration is, we call our scoring function. So you know, these, are, these are down in the like 20 to 40 level numbers of iterations. So these are very, very small searches. And here we're able to see uh, improvements in performance. Um, and especially we found the NVIDIA occupancy calculator is wrong about this with Mandelbrot, um, at least for the, the machine we ran it on. Um, and the version on the right, we have some domain knowledge, which is why the graph is smaller. We cut down the, the we assume the thread parameter should be some multiple 32, right? Uh, which is a pretty good assumption to make. Um, right, so the, the plot shows that simulated kneeling works the best on this problem and hill climbing is the worst. Um, and there's actually some intuition for why that's the case. Uh, so it appears that this problem is hard enough that the search procedure is sort of in danger of getting stuck in a, a local optima. Um, so having some amount of randomness in your search can sort of kick it out of the, the local optima. Uh, hill climbing is especially in danger of this uh, and the other algorithms that use some amount of randomness uh, perform better. And here's histogram. Again, we have some domain knowledge uh, on the right uh, where we're doing multiples of 32. Uh, here, the, the trade-off is essentially how much uh, sequential computation to do. That's what we're tuning. Um, and in this case, our domain knowledge wasn't actually totally helpful because the full search found a better solution. But the more interesting thing to see here is that after a fair number of iterations, pretty much all of the search strategies are finding good answers. Uh, so the thing to take away from that is this is low-hanging fruit. Uh, this is an example of, you know, if you can spare the cycles to do 15, 20 evaluations of your kernel, uh, then you don't have to decide this. This can be decided online. Right? So lastly, can we improve uh, on our TuneM interface? And we have two uh, ways we think of for doing that. So the simple auto-tuning interface, like I said, is a big, ugly pile of scripts. Um, and one thing that we might want to gu uh, guarantee doesn't happen is the evaluation function never asks for a parameter that isn't part of its search space. Uh, so essentially, uh, in functional speak, we want to observe the, the, observe the structure of the evaluation computation to prevent this from happening. And so one way to do this is uh, to formulate the problem uh, as an applicative functor corresponding to the applicative class in Haskell. Right, so applicatives are useful when the structure of a computation needs to be observed, uh, such as collecting data fetch requests in the ha uh, Haskell project, or in our case, collecting calls to get param. So here, tune t is uh, parameterized over a monad m. And so this business of abstracting over an underlying monad wasn't necessary before, uh, because any monad could be made an instance of tune m. And also, git param doesn't have to bother with the indirection of a, a name or an index. It can just state its domain directly. Um, unfortunately, we can't use do notation here, which makes this abstraction a little bit awkward to use. So in general, this is a form of effect composition that works less smoothly than monad transformers, for example. So don't like that. Uh, what about extensible effects? Right. So as an alternative for applicative tuning, we can look at this. Uh, for the purposes of auto-tuning, we have an effect which is param s, which is basically like a reader effect. We want to read that parameter. Um, we could use any type for s, but here we use type-level strings of kind symbol, uh, which provide us with an unlimited source of unique types uh, without needing new, uh, new type declarations. And since GHC 7.8 uh, GHC typelets module provides facilities for dealing with these uh, type-level string literals, uh, including synthesizing, uh, can I use my mouse here? Uh, synthesizing instances of the, the known symbol class, right there. Um, so the return value of git param is still a uh, simple integer. Um, and for its input here, we use the, the somewhat standard approach of passing a, a proxy data type, um, which is with a phantom type argument as a means of passing a, a type to an argument to, as, as an argument to the function. So here's how you would use it. Uh, to invoke git param, uh, the user needs only to pass in the type level name of the parameter. Uh, and by passing the parameters to the type level, it's possible to know which parameters the computation uses before we run it. Uh, and it's possible to write different versions of run search uh, for different search strategies. Um, this also ensures uh, composability. 
So it's possible to run you know, sub-computations uh, with two parameters or whatever and to compose it with a larger computation uh, and jointly optimize, optimize across a larger set of uh, parameters, for example. Right, so uh, there we do it. We can tune it. Uh, you should too. This result uh, represents the sort of the first steps towards tackling some of the larger goals we're looking at, um, which involves sort of composing and nesting uh, these auto-tuning searches. Uh, and the approach of having uh, an, ex an expressive meta-language to express all of this, uh, we found uh, helped a lot in our work. Um, and in the particular problem we are considering here, uh, we think that it would be a good idea to, to uh, if you're worried about this sort of problem, to be able to do the searching online, uh, because it only takes a couple of seconds often. And that's it. Thank you. So the, the parameters are the, uh, I, can go, I can give you a concrete example <laughs> back at uh, Mandelbrot. All right, so this is tuning the number of pixels computed uh, per thread and block, uh, so that kind of thing. So they're basically fixed parameters there. Uh, and so you get um, sort of fixed mm -hmm. How does it stack up against hand tuning? Um, well, so one, one comparison would be uh, we are uh, in some cases able to beat the uh, NVIDIA Occupancy calculator. Um, I, so I'm not exactly sure uh, what a, a, a human expert would be able to do that we couldn't find relatively quickly here because uh, these search spaces aren't massively huge uh, and especially with so a, a human expert maybe would express what they know as, a, a, as domain knowledge to the search. Uh, and that would be beneficial, I think. Um, maybe, maybe there are some parameters that were surprising that you don't think uh, So cases where the, uh, like in, in histogram, where the, the, the best results that we found in our short search um, came from when we were not incorporating the domain knowledge and where our assumption of it being a multiple of 32 was wrong. That was a bit surprising. Mm -hmm. the is not portable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. So did you have any examples that you did very poorly on? Kind of um, so we, did, we didn't have an example we did poorly on. We did, had an example that just sort of didn't work, which was the, the breadth for a search. The problem was you quickly get into, it's, it's not obvious from that picture, but that area in the corner where it's bright yellow is actually massive. Um, so it's hard to even make an argument about what the optimal solution is because we didn't have enough computing power to explore everything. Or the hand tuning. Yeah, or the, or the hand tuning. Well, in the hand tuning version, it, yeah. So that in in those cases, we sort of we think we're doing pretty well. It appears to, from the, from the image, but it's it's hard to know for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so if I understand what you're saying, you're, you're exposing these parameters in, a, in a, some sort of sequence of computations. Yes, actually, this is actually something that, that's, uh, I didn't talk about in, our, in the, the talk, but this is something we're really concerned about. Like what if you make one tuning decision, like you say, I choose some number n, and then that exposes n new choices. Yes. So those choices are all dependent on the choice you just made. Yes, yes, and uh, so this is uh, motivating sort of our work in making this uh, compose and nest. Because right, we'd like to use this in a system like Accelerate, where you want to make very high-level choices and then very low-level choices. And the low-level choices are influenced by the high-level ones. Uh, and we have some sketches for how to do that. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Any further questions? Let's thank the speaker.